Hey folks, Sean here, and what I wanna to talk to you about is something that has become increasingly obvious to me over time as I'm helping people be successful in B2B SaaS, and that's the fact that you need to keep your software simple. It's gonna make everything easier. Allow me to show you with a real world example of something you're probably familiar with. So I wanna demonstrate this for you via story. My wife and I moved recently into a new apartment. In that new apartment, it came with a new refrigerator. Now, our old refrigerator had a water dispenser part of it, which is something that we used quite a bit. The new one did as well. However, it worked quite differently, and I didn't know that until I tried to use it. My wife had the same problem, but let me explain. Normally, when I see these, I grab a glass if I want some water, and then I just press the glass against the water dispenser, water comes out, fills my glass, right? Sounds pretty straightforward. However, that wasn't what happened in this case. In this case, like you've probably seen other people make a mistake like this before, press the water glass against the lever and a bunch of ice poured out, some spilling all over the floor. <laughs> you may have been there before yourself. Sometimes you have to press a button, right, in order to get it to switch from water to, or from ice cubes to water or whatever. Whatever it is you're looking for, there are, usually are some controls and I do a lot of work in usability. So you'd think that someone who focuses on usability this would be relatively straightforward for them, but you'd be mistaken here yet again. <laughs> so long story short, I couldn't find a way to switch that lever from ice to water, which is what I wanted, until I realized that there wasn't just one lever, there was actually two. This refrigerator had two levers. One was seemingly integrated, almost meant to not stick out, which again, questionable choice I might add. But regardless, once I figured out that there was a separate lever that was seemingly kind of integrated into the design that I needed to press the glass against in order to receive water, I realized ultimately how it worked. There's a large lever that's dedicated apparently just for ice and there's another one that's specific for water. Anyway, long story short, I made that mistake using something that I've used, I don't even know how many times before, many times before, and even still, I got it wrong. Plus, I focus on usability all the time. Now, same thing happened when my wife went to use it, and she's a lot smarter than me. She has more advanced degrees, all kinds of stuff, but same problem, uh, and I need to explain to her what I had learned in order to use a water dispenser. Now, why am I telling you this water dispenser story? Well, because you'd think that something like that would be relatively easy for people to figure out how to use, and again, you'd probably be wrong just based on the story I told you. Not for one, but two people, one of which supposedly focuses on usability quite a bit, so. That story, as embarrassing as it may be, I think tells a really powerful story in that even something that should be relatively simple in its usage can still be used incorrectly or designed in, in inappropriately, whatever. Anyway, whatever the problem is, what I was ultimately trying to do, I was unable to do until I figured out how to use this thing. So my point here is that this is a problem I see all the time in software and one that gets made continuously and one that continues to be a bigger and bigger problem is people are making their software too complicated in my opinion. Whereas you should be focusing on however possible to make the solution to the problem that your customer has through your B2B SaaS application as simple as possible. Now that doesn't mean that it's ineffective. You can make a simple design very effective. And I would argue that simpler designs that solve the problem are arguably more effective. But that's what I'm gonna talk to you about in greater detail in this video. And I wanted to share you that as an story as, because it's something that I've gone through very recently and I think it's very relevant to this topic. So what should your goal be when you're trying to design kind of experience and the value that your customer should be getting from your B2B SaaS application? Well, I think this quote summarizes it much better than I ever could. And it's that achieving simplicity is the real sophistication, as in the bigger challenge is creating a simple but effective experience. That is my guiding principle whenever I'm trying to think through how I can build a better, more effective solution through my software for my customer. Now, if you think about the advantages of designing something that is a bit simpler in execution, there are advantages on both sides of the spectrum. There's for you, the founder or owner operator of a B2B SaaS business and the customer as well too. And let me share with you what I mean. If you're focusing on a design or engineering solution that is going to be simpler, that's going to be easier, faster, cheaper to build. That's going to be easier to market and sell, right? Simplicity here doesn't just help you in one category, it helps you in many. 
all of those things are advantages for you, especially when you're going to be competing against someone else who has a more complicated solution. Now you might look at all those features and you might think, oh man, they have all this custom capability and all these extra features. We don't have those features. Like we're gonna lose our customers. Our customers are gonna flock to that piece of software and what I want to tell you there is that I've been there and I've built that software and that's typically not the case, especially not nowadays. <laughs> Remember back to my water dispenser story and it was frustrating for us to try to figure out how to put water in class. <laughs> so as ridiculous as that sounds, your users going through that probably at a scale 10 times the amount of emotion and frustration when they're trying to figure out how to get value from your software. So trust me, keep it simple. Now, if we think about it from the advantages on the customer side, it's going to be easier for them to use and it's going to be easier for them to get value out of. So that really is your ultimate goal. You want to make sure that you're building a solution to a significant problem for your customer and that it solves it in an effective way. And what would solve it in a more effective way than if it was easier to use and also to get value out of? Okay, so you might be thinking that this all sounds great, but ultimately, how do I do that? If I have a more complicated product and I want to make it simpler or I'm starting out and I want to make sure that I don't fall into this trap of creating software that's more complicated than it needs to be, how do I do it? Well, in the research that I've done and the mistakes that I've made myself, typically what ends up happening is you're trying to solve too many problems at once, focusing on too much, which ultimately leads you to build more features, more advanced capability into your product. Reason why, again, this is a problem is because your product's trying to do too much and your customer doesn't need that or want that, then that's going to make your user experience messy. As in, every feature you add to your product that your customer doesn't need or use makes the user experience worse. They don't think about it in terms of just skipping it or not using it. They see it and it creates more of a clunky, confusing interface for them because they don't know what it is and they feel like they probably should be using it. So easiest way to do that or to prevent yourself from falling into this trap and making sure that ultimately the product that you're going to be building is going to be simpler but effective is to laser focus on the top problem. Now this construct is one that I've created and I use this in communication with my clients and education and training to help them figure out how to find and then ultimately focus on the top problem and I call it my buckets and marbles situation. Now the way that I leverage this is when you're doing your research, when you're doing your discovery, as you're figuring out what those problems are that your customers need solved, you ultimately create a bucket to store instances of hearing about the same problem. So the buckets themselves represent unique problems. And as you're doing more interviews or you're collecting more data, and as you're finding additional instances of those problems, you take a marble and you drop it into the bucket for which you already have one to fit a relatively similar problem. Over time, after you've done a certain amount of interviews, you will have any number of buckets and they will all typically be of different weights. You can then sort these buckets by weight and that's how you'll ultimately be able to identify quantitatively which of the problems that you've heard of while doing this qualitative research ultimately is the top problem. When you know that, now you can laser focus on that one and just that one and you can design your experience around that. That will help you tremendously in preventing you from figuring out you know, do I add all these features or how many features do I need to add? <laughs> you know, which is an easy trap to fall into, right? Because you don't want to solve all these problems at once. Now, another thing to be cautious of here is that your customers, your users, the people you're doing discovery with, they might ask you to solve all of their problems. They don't want that. That time and time again in practice has been shown to not be an effective way to provide them with solutions because it becomes overwhelming for them. They're just not thinking of that in the moment and customers and users don't ultimately have good recollection of using new products, trying to solve problems. If it tries to do too much all at once, it ultimately becomes overwhelming for them and they usually get frustrated and quit. So what I recommend that you do, laser focus on the top problem and make sure that you're solving that one and only that one, especially in the beginning. This next strategy I call is my skip the spinning rims approach. <laughs> so if any of you out there have ever dove into the Marvel universe or watched any of those movies, there's a scene in the first Iron Man, I think, where Downey Jr., who plays the who plays the character Iron Man, he is getting ready to test his suit, is like one of his first versions of the Iron Man suit. And he's going back and forth with his AI assistant, Jarvis, I believe is the name. And when he's getting ready to test it and ultimately fly in the suit, Jarvis is challenging him by saying that we haven't run all of these tests yet. And he utters some type of phrase along the lines of, so skip the spinning rims, we're on the clock. So I think of that all the time when I'm evaluating 
someone's B2B SaaS product and it clearly is, is expecting to do too much or trying to do too much and they don't really have great context for why. So if you keep this in the back of your mind, as you're going through the solution design component, after you've identified that top problem we're solving or laser focusing on that top problem, think of the simplest but most effective solution that you can come up with in order to solve that problem in your software, right? And again, the idea here is to do so in as simple a way as possible. So if you can solve it in three steps as opposed to five, I'm always going to defer to less steps, less complication, and a more a simpler that but still an effective solution to that problem because it's going to make your software easier to use, right? What you don't want to happen is you don't want your users to become frustrated by the first experience they have with your application because what they're ultimately going to do is they're just not going to adopt it or they're going to flee for a simpler solution. I find myself doing this all the time. When I'm looking for a specific problem to be solved, I think I was looking for the other day how to convert a particular file to another format, like a native Apple something or other to a JPEG or a ping or whatever it is, right? I was trying to solve a very specific problem. So I was searching for a solution to that. And some uh, products that I were finding had so many steps for me to go through, it was ridiculous. Others are just like, cool, give us the file here, here, give us the input, here's the output. Love it, fantastic. And I will go back and I will use those products over and over again because the experience is simple and effective. It helps me get to the outcome that I'm looking for as fast as possible. That's what your software needs to be focused on. If you don't take that approach and you continue to add complexity, then it's gonna overwhelm and frustrate your user. So it is definitely in your advantage to start small here Keep in mind, you can build from there, right? But start small and do testing often. If you get them onboarded to your uh, your program, your application, and then you measure their experience, are they getting value out of it? Are they using it consistently? If the adoption cycle and curve there goes well, they will provide you with feedback in terms of what else they would like to see. But you've got to make sure that if you're planning to add to that, that you're adding maximum amount of value for the majority of your users. Otherwise, just like I said before, if you're adding more features that most people are not going to use, you're actually going to make the experience worse for most of your user base. So keep it simple, especially in the solution design phase. Now, by far the best piece of advice that I could give anyone looking to design, build, launch new B2B SaaS applications is sell it before you build it. This is something that this is a mistake that I've made myself when I was trying to design and build my first B2B SaaS application, and it is still the best lesson that I've learned to date. I continue to push the boundaries and what's capable here, and this is by far the best thing that you can do if you're trying to succeed in B2B SaaS. I'm running experiments now with the tools that I'm building where I am measuring the unit economics to make sure that I'm generating a positive return in a very narrow window before I even enter the solution design phase, which has helped even more so than it has before. But you really need to validate whatever concept that you're planning on bringing to market. And people still aren't doing this. And with the invention of new AI tools, which helps us get through building products that are more capable, faster, I'm only seeing this problem actually get worse. People are bringing solutions to market that do not have a need. As such, that's only gonna to lead to more failure. So I really need you to validate as early as possible whether or not there is a market for ultimately the solution that you're trying to bring. And a way to do that is to sell it before you build it. Now I've talked about this before and some of the pushback that I get is, well, I can't, how do I actually sell something that I don't have? I don't have it, how do I sell it, right? I wanna challenge that by sharing with you another example in terms of something that you do probably all the time or at least have done before, right? Think of yourself as being at a restaurant planning to order a meal, right? What does that experience look like? When you're ordering from your waiter or waitress and you're looking in the menu of options, do you make said waiter and waitress bring out to you the hamburger or the salad or whatever it is that you're planning on potentially buying? No, right? That's likely not the case. You have enough information to make an informed decision about what it is that you wanna purchase. You have a description of the product. You have potential pricing on the product so you know whether or not it meets your budget, whether or not it meets your needs, whatever you're in the mood for, you are making a purchasing decision without actually seeing or experiencing that product. Same thing is, potent, is entirely possible when you're talking about software. Most people are not really looking for a demo when they're trying to figure out whether or not your product will help solve their problem. That takes quite a bit more time 
And I understand that that is a strategy, product-led growth, all that kind of stuff, which is great. But that is later stage stuff than what we're talking about right now. I need you to sell what it is you're planning on building before you build it. Because if you head down that road of building, that is the most time consuming, the most expensive, it ties up the most resources. And if you're heading in the wrong direction from the beginning, that is really heavy groundwork stuff that is very difficult to reverse or change course on once you've set out on that path. And it's really, really important to get this right, right out of the gate. Uh, and if you don't, and if you haven't validated what it is you're building, you might wind up building something that you can't sell. And if you can't sell what it is you're building, then why did you build it? Or why would you build it? You're literally wasting all of that time, effort, and resources. So this is the most important thing that you can do on the earlier stage side. Even if you have an existing B2B SaaS business, this doesn't have to be just from new. We're talking about getting more out of the product development process. Sell what you're planning to add to your product before you add to your product. Get a better understanding of whether or not your users and customers would use or and get value out of, whether or not they would pay for these new features that you're talking about adding before you build them. Same concept applies, right? It doesn't matter. I'm working with an organization now that's over 100 years old. Their software has been around for decades and they have not been doing that process. So I'm helping them figure out how to incorporate that process, right? So this applies to all B2B SaaS products and applications, regardless of whether or not you're brand new and starting out or your product has been around for quite a long time. Selling something in terms of a feature and functionality or value that you want to add before you build it is one of the best things that you can do to get more out of and increase your odds significantly of achieving success in B2B SaaS. All right, case study time. So I'm going to be incorporating more antidotes into the content that I'm producing, which is from the actual SaaS applications that I've built myself so that you can see what leveraging these strategies looks like in practice and then apply them yourself to whatever it is that you're working on. Now, one of my SaaS applications has previously competed in the HR tech space, and it was a tool that we were trying to potentially bring to market to help companies essentially hire more effectively, just improve the hiring process. And this loop that I have here is a overview or potential summary of everything that I've described thus far. So I'm going to dictate it or describe this story in a similar fashion. Now, the first part of that was figuring out whether or not we were ultimately going to be laser focused on the top problem, right? That's the first point that I've made here. And that's the discovery component. So what we did was we identified a target market, right? HR leaders, people in town acquisition, uh, different roles like that. And then we interviewed them. What are your biggest hiring challenges, right? And again, we went deeper into hiring specifically because that's the area that we wanted to focus. Remember, the more niche you get here, the higher quality data you're going to get from your qualitative investment into research. So upon performing that research, we end up finding out that there's a gap. There's a challenge in the hiring process. The companies are struggling with retention and turnover, and these problems are expensive. They're causing significant impact to what it is that they're doing. So as such, now we had a better understanding of whether or not we were in the area of a relatively painful problem or a problem worth solving, and we felt like we were. So we started workshopping solution design. How could we, in the most simple but effective way, solve that problem for them? Long story short, we ended up designing an assessment which leveraged their culture to be able to evaluate soft skills in addition to complementing what they were doing to measure the hard skills or the technical skills, which we end up found, we ended up finding out through research was a greater predictor for long-term success, right? So it was the increased the probability of being able to combat these challenging problems for our target market in that reducing their turnover, reducing and increasing their, ten, their retention. So we went back to them before building, right? Because again, guy was already saying we want a, the simplest, most effective solution and we want to sell it before we build it, right? So we went back to the target market that we did the, re, the research and discovery with to say, here's our product and what it's, what it's capable of, right? We hadn't built a product yet. This was solution design phase, but we articulated for them what it would do. Assessment leverages your culture, quantifies it, and then it ultimately is going to help you figure out in your hiring process who you're considering whether or not they're going to be a good match for your culture now we got positive response to that but that isn't as far as we wanted to go i wanted to see real dollars or a form of commitment here in terms of whether or not they would actually be interested in buying this product right because that was the whole idea are they going to purchase this product and that's ultimately what i did this was a while back and i've got other ideas to share with you now but way back then years ago I was asking them to 
essentially validate their level of interest in what it was we were intending on building and we were going to provide them with access to it if they would hold a place in line by sending us a check. Didn't have to be a check for a huge amount of money, but just them going through that exercise indicated to me that they were serious about wanting access to this solution. That was a great leading indicator that they have a legitimate interest in what it is we're planning on building. And I started to collect those checks. That was, I got that buying interest from folks in the target market, which gave me the impression that there was real validity to this concept here. And we did that first before we move forward into the build stage. And then when the product was ultimately ready, we provided them with access, they were paying for that. And then we move forward with measuring whether or not they were getting value out of it and everything else that we do in terms of scaling from there. That strategy helped us in a considerable way, bring a product to market much, much more effectively than just guessing or making a ton of assumptions about what it is we ultimately might build. Without that high, high probability that we might build the wrong thing or bring a product to market that doesn't solve a problem or a pressing need. So it was a great form of validation to get a better understanding whether or not we were on the right track. There's other things you could do there too. I've stood up landing pages, I've used ads, in order to send traffic to those landing pages. I've got the lead capture set up for SaaS products I'm working on today. And in the lead capture, they're telling me how much they'd pay for access to the product. Some of that is advertised on my landing pages. There are lots of ways to test whether or not you're able to sell your product and how, how much you might be able to sell your product for before you move forward with building it so that you can start to evaluate your unit economic model. Are you generating a return? Can you build a product and ultimately provide a product for a dollar and make $2 for it, right? Simple stuff, but really, really effective, especially early stage as you're intending to provide validation to make sure that you're on the right track. Hey folks, thanks for watching my content. I hope you got value out of it. If you did, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel so you can be notified when more content like this becomes available. And my question for you today, which I'd love for you to answer in the comments below, is what is your favorite form or strategy of validating a concept before you build it to make sure that you know you're on the right track?